Welcome to the 6th Annual Leadership Conference of the Losing Environmental Action Network, better known to all of you as LEAN. Uh, someone that we all lean on from time to time and someone that looks to all of us too. To, it's not on? Is this better? Yeah, sounds better to me too. Hmm. Somehow this is bound to work. We welcome all of you to this conference. So many of you were a little late starting, but that isn't going to keep us from having a good time. I'm Lorena Pospichel, I am interim president and serving until this meeting and through this meeting. I'm from Labuse, Louisiana, which is close to Alexandria, Central Park. And I'm a member of the Concerned Citizens of Senlon, which is very active in environmental affairs at home. And I would like for each one of you to introduce yourself, uh, saying, giving us your name, where you're from, and what group you're with, if you're with a group. And if uh, not, just give us a little short something about why you're here. Okay, we'll just start over. Well, let's start with our board members, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm Florence Robinson. Bart Lewis, small business. I work inside all of the chemical plants. I am uh, the board of the Louisiana Chemical Industry Alliance. I've been going up on their governmental affairs committee, and they only respond to pressure. <laughs> Thank you. 
that have recently surfaced from the petrochemical facility. My name's Angel McGee. I'm also a member of Cedar Grove Community Group in Bow Chase. I'm Jess Price. I'm from Pollock, Louisiana. I'm president of the Little River Club. And I'd like to tell Willie that we almost have the river cleaned up. We have plenty of fish. Thank you for working for you. from Citizens Clearing House for Hazardous Waste, and I'm our Southeastern Regional Director, or whatever that means, out of Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, I'm Christina Ressler. I'm with the National Coalition Against the Misuse of Pesticides. This is my first trip to Louisiana. Real happy to be here. I'm Ellen Marie Burrell, also from Alton, Louisiana, and with Florence Patterson, also a new fight against Rollins. I'm Juanita Stewart from Alton, Louisiana with Florence Robinson, and we're trying to fight Robinson because they're trying to expand, and we got one this. They brought in nuclear waste in 1991, and we don't know how much radioactive material is in our ground. I'm Megan O'Neill. Um, I'm a Yale undergraduate from right outside New Orleans, and I'm doing an internship at the Tulane Environmental Law Clinic this summer. My name is Walter McClatchy. I'm an attorney in Shreveport and vice president of Recall 92. I'm Amy Jones, I'm from Shreveport, and I'm here with um, the Greens and Environmental Club in our school. I'm Heather Curtis, I'm from Shreveport, Louisiana, and I'm the president of the Greens and Environmental Club. Young people. Yay! <laughs> I'm Jeanette Tate, I'm from Shreveport, Louisiana, and Two and a half years ago, realizing that we've been exposed to uh, <coughs> hazardous chemicals, formed uh, concerned citizens for a clean environment, and now we're fighting to clean up a 235 plus acre refinery site that's completely developed. And I designed a um, t shirt, and I'm going to be selling me, uh, <laughs> throw the rascals out. It's, um, if anybody wants to look, I want to look at it afterwards. <laughs> it's a good shirt. My name is Bernie Snow, and I've been playing games in the legislature. Uh, we're going to be pushing through a bunch of garbage incinerator bills. We've got enough pollution in Louisiana. I've got three file candidates on garbage incineration. I'm collecting more information. We need to network because we need to stop these things before they start. I'm Mary Grosso, and I'm looking organization called Hope, New and Club Hop and Beach Environment. Uh, I live in Crowley, which is in the Cajun Parish, and we have been successful in getting a few people to clean up their act, and we're going to go all the way to either the New Clean Parish, and we're also concerned about any state of uh, a polluting business or the hazardous of recyclers, they call themselves sometimes. Citizen Action in Louisiana. And Dart have to be among the allies today. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Bill Redding. I'm a Midwest uh, Social Degree representative for the Midwest, uh, pardon me, the Sierra Club. And I'm also the uh, director of the Mississippi River Basin Eco Region Project of the Sierra Club, covering some 33 states and four bases and uh, with Mary Lee's help, we will afford to know I uh, My name is Daryl Malik Wiley from New Orleans. Uh, Sierra Club and other environmental groups, some sort of an environmental radical uh, <laughs> raising help from so I don't know how to do anything but raise help. <laughs> I'm Julie Schwamm Harris from New Orleans, member of various uh, environmental groups. I'm the environmental uh, representative for the National Council of Jewish Women to the uh, Groups in the world. I do grassroots political organizing on various issues and uh, hope to do a lot more of it on the environment. Uh, I'm Steve.
Steve Suggs. I'm uh, doing research on the uh, chemical industry in Louisiana and um, also specifically Greek corn, Macaran's activities in the other region. Uh, my name is Brian Miller. I'm with uh, SEEK, Student Environmental Action Coalition at the USL chapter. Um, basically, we're here. We, we're forming a reasonably large group in the state, getting more and more active universities. In fact, we just had a march like two weeks ago, which we were very happy about. Yay! My name is Mark Ford. I'm from LSU, and I'm part of a small group that's trying to get an environmental group going on campus. My name is Stephen Robbs. I'm also with Mark here at LSU. Where Group is organization of students concerned about resources and trying to get started at LSU. Anything else in the seat? I'm Willie Norris. This is my wife, Mary. Uh, I'm from Winfield, Louisiana, and Wynn Parish. Uh, I'm a police guard in Wynn Parish, and I'm concerned about our groundwater up there that's being uh, polluted by intrusion of salt water. David Gooch from out of the Louisiana. I'm here with Faith of the Minion Association to protect the environment. Marietta Her, League of Women Voters of New Orleans. <coughs> Karen Kovac, League of Women Voters of New Orleans and St. Bernard Citizens for Environmental Equality. I'm Lisa Brown. I live in Baton Rouge and I'm here to become better informed. <laughs> well, I'm Hermaine Shelstead, a New Iberian who's recently migrated to New Orleans and hopes to join some of the New Orleans environmental groups. Um, I've also worked with an engineering group, a uh, company that's uh, designed and engineered uh, several uh, environmentally conscious uh, products and systems. Linda King with the Environmental Health Network, and I want to say I'm excited about all the students and young people I see in here today. They're the next ones to carry the banner. Thank you for coming. I'm Michelle Bond with Save Our Lakes and Rex here in Baton Rouge. Mary Tellar, I'm the chairman of War on Waste Management. <laughs> recently become environmental advisor to the mayor of New Iberia, which is a complete turnaround from the way it was five years ago. So it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> My name is Will Coletta. I'm the uh, Western representative, uh, Washington representative of uh, the Western Organization of Resource Councils in uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, it's good to be back. My name is Gary Brown. I'm not running for anything. <laughs> uh, I'm Director of Program Development for Food and Water. Uh, I came here today to talk to you about food irradiation and why the nuclear industry is coming here next month to convince your fishermen that they should irradiate their fish. My name is Gary Gresh. I'm executive director of the Alliance for Affordable Energy. Uh, we've just established uh, the first state-of-the-art lease cost plan in the city of New Orleans. We're going statewide now, and our theory is that it is uh, cheaper to, uh, uh, to save the environment than to kill it. And we can do it uh, through proper energy. So hope to talk to you later. I'll have a, uh, uh, a table out in the hall. I'm Kate Marchand, I'm with the Sierra Club, and I just coordinated the Trash Art Show at the Museum of the Americas, and I'm here with Jerry and Food and Water. 
I'm John Coffler from West Feliciana Parish. Um, with Citizens Organized to Protect Our Parish, which is concerned uh, greatly with the strip mining that's going on in some of our uh, creeks and uh, rivers. And, uh, just, well, it's just a pristine area, and what they've done is come in, and we're here to uh, sort of ally ourselves with uh, whoever we can to get some support. Thank you. I'm Melissa Thorne. I'm an attorney at the Tulane Environmental Law Club. Wilma Suber from New Iberia. I work with citizens groups all over Louisiana and the nation on hazardous waste and solid waste issues, off-field waste and pesticide issues. Bob Moss, Bishop of Green Bay, says to me, son of a I'm Nell Hahn from Lafayette, and uh, I'm a student at the LSU Environmental Studies, and I'm interested in hooking up with people from <coughs> close to my area. Some more that came in here too. If you'll just stand and take your name. I'm Shirley Goldsmith. I'm like Charles. I'm the founder and current president of the Environmental Group Swing. I'm Jerry Ortland. I'm from Lake Charles. I'm founder and uh, chairperson of ICE. I want to talk clean with ICE. Hi, my name is Steve Henning, and I'm a student at UNO, a graduate student, and uh, I work. I work as a graduate assistant for the uh, Environmental Institute there, and I'm interested in studying uh, how labor and environment uh, are being pitted against each other by capital. Skip Gladney uh, with the Invo House Center for Peace and Justice here in Baton Rouge. Um, I'm Audrey Evans, the Community Outreach Coordinator at the Tulane Environmental Law Clinic. Uh, new announcement, we have a model bad boy ordinance finally for all the different parishes that might be interested in uh, picking up on this issue. Have you introduced, everybody introduced themselves in? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, Joel Lindsay, Center for Energy Studies at, uh, and Environmental Studies at Southern University here in Baton Rouge. Anyone else? I'm Linda Muslisi Kimball. I'm a grassroots uh, peace activist and a member of the Environmental Commission for the City of Oxford, Ohio. But I am a native New Orleanian, and I am back in Louisiana the past couple of weeks as a national field organizer for the Nuclear Testing Moratorium. I have some literature I've left out, uh, in, out, out front to uh, uh, encourage you to uh, lean on Johnston, who is a key vote on this issue. And we are within two votes of, getting, of winning this one this year, the nuclear testing moratorium. Just excellent. I want to know how many people are here from North Louisiana. Please raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and North of Baton Rouge. <laughs> That's fantastic because it seems like most of our people, and still are, uh, have been from, that have been attending, have been from South Louisiana. And we're so happy that people from north of Red River and above have been coming. And we welcome you and hope this will be first of many visits. Uh, we're also so uh, pleased to know that so many different organizations are uh, represented, not uh, only those that are in Louisiana, but outside of Louisiana that are interested in what we're doing, and we can learn from you too. So this is a mutually beneficial meeting. I'd like to now uh, go ahead and introduce Mary Leor, our executive director. And uh, she's been, I guess, she's been with this group since the beginning. In fact, I think she's one of the birthing mothers or whatever you want to call them. <laughs> but uh, Still trying to give birth. <laughs> this is a long labor, huh? That's right. <laughs> Hi, it's Mary, Mary Lee R. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Are we psyched and ready to have a good day? I mean, this is going to be so awesome. I mean, not only do I see old friends that I had marched with and had victories with and have had some defeats with, I see some new faces, and you are, are what is going to make this conference so wonderful. And I just can't thank you enough for, for attending. But those folks that helped make this position a lot easier for me is my staff, and I, I have to introduce them. Pat. Mahan in the back is our camera person, our project director, and anything else that he has to do. And so I want you to give him a big hand because he's so wonderful. <laughs> and but about those doors, I hope you met were Ramona Stevens, our field staff, and Juan Hines, who's also now full time in staff. And here comes another person, Robert. We're all introducing ourselves. Do you want to say who you are, real quick, Robert? <laughs> He's never going to forgive me for doing this. <laughs> anyway, I don't ha have anything to say to you except thanks for coming. I hope you learn a lot. Oh, I introduced, um, did I not mention Juan? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mention Juan. See, they just keep me directed all the time. They said I didn't mention Juan Hines. And ha Robert, do me a favor, open that door and have Ramon and Juan step in, because I want you to look for these purple ribbons. If you have a problem and you need some help, look for us. We'll be happy to, like, do anything we can to make sure that today is comfortable and fun because we're going to celebrate, we're going to learn a lot, and just have a great time. Um, I want to thank my board, part of who are here, Daryl, Lorena, Florence, and Willie. I just couldn't do it without all of you, and I thank you very much. I have to say one quick thing about somebody who's in the audience. Michael Parfett is the only man, I would venture to say, who rafted here to the Ramada. He is on a raft. He's rafting down the Mississippi River. He ties his raft up, gets out, interviews people. So thanks for rafting in, Michael. <laughs> so it's going to be a great day. Oh, here's Ramona Stevens. I wanted to make sure. Hey, Ramona. Couldn't do without her. Where's Juan? Have him step in. OK, make Juan come in. And we want to welcome you. We were introducing ourselves. Do you mind just telling us who you are? OK, and where are you from, Albert? Uh, St. Joe's Parish. Great, welcome. We welcome you. We're happy to see you. And that's about all I want to say. I think Lorena's going to take over and tell you where you can break up. Uh, it's the Bienville room, the Laplace room. We'll direct you when you go out. Linda has one thing. Can remind you about making an announcement? Oh, that's right. Linda wants to make an important announcement real quick before we break up, OK? Do you have the certificates? I do have them right outside the door. Juan, get her certificates, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's one. <laughs> Wonderful one, yay! <laughs> <laughs> the other one. So, the, the ones underneath it, one. <laughs> and what we are asking each and every one of you to do for this national release, we do have releases in all 50 states. The national church leaders are behind this. And basically what we're releasing this report as is an equity issue. Because it is the poorest communities in the nation that are impacted by toxins. And it is the poorest among us who have no health insurance, and no regular health care, that once we become ill from toxins, we cannot find help. And the federal government has come in, and they have covered up, done shoddy studies. And we, I'm very happy to say in this report, we case study five communities. One of those communities is St. Gabriel, Louisiana. And we, as soon as we, and we have a documentary that follows with this report where we went into those five communities, and we filmed the most unbelievable stories of what the federal health agencies have done in these communities. What we're asking each and every one of you to do, and I'll make this announcement again this afternoon, is we want to send a message to Barry Johnson and Vernon Howe, who's head of ATSDR and CDC, the federal health agencies. This is the people's life insurance. This certificate is a symbol of the thousands of lives that are at risk in polluted communities across the United States. We are asking 
Who is taking responsibility to safeguard the citizens against life-threatening living conditions? We'd like for each and every one of you to sign one of these certificates. Give it back to me so that we can take these to Washington, D.C. and present them to the head of ATSDR, the head of CDC, and maybe even the Federal Attorney General's Office and press charges against those people who have literally killed people in communities. Thank you. There's a lot of literature on the tables out there, and I hope sometime during the day you will take the time to pick some up. Uh, right now, we need to get to our groups. Track A is Hubert Dixon. Would you stand, please? He will be in the Bienville room. What? Send you out of the room, Hubert. Yeah, we will be sending you out of the room, that's for sure. <laughs> The Bienville Room. <laughs> so if anybody wants to uh, hear his presentation on combating environmental racism, go to the Bienville Room with Hubert Dixon. Track B is Christina Ressler. Is she? Here. Oh, there you are. Okay. Uh, hers is the buzz on pesticides that be in the Laplace Room. I hope I said that right. My French is terrible. <laughs> but uh, you are now... Um, We'll go to your rooms, then we will have a break at 11 o'clock, and um, you can return here at 11. so much what we learn or do in the workshops, 
but the opportunities to meet other people and interact and to talk, and often we don't get enough chance to do that. We talk to the people we already know, but not to the newer folks that may come along. So I want to take just a couple of minutes for the people that are just nearest to you, just tell them your name personally and what issue that you're particularly working in and, and where you at. And just let's just take a couple of minutes just to do that. Let's see some handshakes. <laughs> conditions 
But typically, this is an example I like to use, here's what the site is, or the proposed site is. This is the community that lives closest to it. But, and unfortunately, the group that forms is about five miles down the road, tends to have a little bit more money, and it's a little bit more towards the European ethnicity, if you know what I'm saying. Um, they may or may not have relationships with this community, but often do not. And they have a great level of success in beating a proposed facility. Because often if you raise enough noise and you mobilize enough people to get to a public hearing, put pressure on the right officials, you might can keep that proposed facility from going in. But the community remains a target, that's first. And secondly, if it's an existing one, as many of you know, it continues to be there. Maybe the little things will be done on the missions this week, but who knows what's going to happen the next three-day weekend. So there's a problem in trying to get these folks here and these folks here working together. Because unless that happens, and unless we truly address how folks can work together from a diverse background and change the political structure in this community and change it so they're no longer a target but dictating what they do want and what they don't want for the community, nothing changes. Because even if you beat that proposed site, you know, you might beat uh, the landfill this week, but somebody, some, some doctor or someone like that from the Northeast will think, hmm, this might be a good place for a medical waste incinerator or this might be a good place for, uh, to do a sham recycling effort or something of that nature. So we have to change the way these communities interact and change the power structure and so these places are no longer seen as, as disempowered individuals but a powerful community. Folks may not have a lot of money but they have numbers and they're human beings and we live in a democracy and we care about each other so these aren't targets anymore and that's what we've got to do. That's the hardest thing about, I think, the whole environmental work that's going on. Because so much of what we're successful is when we can deal with people on an individual level and say, you know, will you come to my meeting? And a person trusts you enough to say, well, sure, I'll come. But the problems we have when dealing with the environmental racism component is we don't build those trusts. We don't necessarily go beyond what we perceive as our community or outside the comfort zone that we set with the folks here and around us and we're not working together. And unless we can work together, hold on a second, uh, uh, we're not going to be able to address the overall problems that we're dealing with in society. How, how do you propose to reach? Uh, I worked seven years. I was co-founder and chairman of Operation Mainstream in the Orleans uh, Adult Literacy. Uh, but bluntly, we worked with 300 black churches, and the ministers had their own agenda. Mm -hmm. Well, what I was going to say, that is the problem. You're working with ministers and not with the flock. Now, we, we move through them, mm -hmm. and that takes some doing, too. Mm -hmm. And see, that's part of, the, I think, the typical thing, and maybe we'll just go on to getting some more meat and potatoes here. Uh, the, the typical scenario is what happens, at least from my work, is I will get a call from uh, a middle-income white group that's five miles down the road. The impact will affect them because... Waste doesn't discriminate. It's going to hurt all of us at one point or another. It may be a little bit slower for some, a little bit faster for others, but it, will all, it impacts on everyone. And the scenario generally works like this. Well, we haven't talked to them yet, or we talked to their leaders or their ministers, and they didn't come to the meeting. And that's where the first problem is, is in the language. Because when you're saying they and them, you're not talking about us, and you're not talking about community and how people can work together. And there's clearly in your language, if you're talking to someone on the phone that's several hundred miles away, then how is your language, what language are you using when you're talking to people in person? Um, in the case of working through the church, because I know a lot of folks say, well, we'll, we'll go to the ministers first. My experience has been that that's, that might be a nice start if you have no connections whatsoever. But as you stated, the ministers have things that they're working on. There are, there are reasons why they're ministers. And whenever you or I or someone else goes to a religious person, or anybody for that matter, you have to figure out how this balances it on in their concerns. And are they truly concerned about changing some of that democratic shift? Because often, I'm going to be honest about it, the, the, the uh, uh, in a black community, for instance, the elected officials and the ministers and the people that are seen as the leaders are some often part of the problem. They're not about democracy. They're not about changing things. They've cut their own little niche there in, in the last 20 years, and they're that entrenched leadership, and they're kind of happy, and they'll, they, they can feel like, I'll go and I'll represent these people, as opposed to those people being able to speak for themselves. 
And this is the same in black communities and white communities alike. When we're organizing in, in, in a white community, how often do folks, the first group they think to go to is the Civitan Club? You don't. I mean, that's not a typical thing. We'll go to the Kiwanis and the Civitan and those groups, and we'll ask them to work on the environmental issues. Well, well gee, those are kind of a business interest, and well, I don't know if they're going to help us. They don't help us with anything else. Um, you've got to go to the people. You've got to go beyond these layers of, of, of leadership and get to the core because when we're talking about empowerment, people feel empowered that they can make a difference themselves, it has to be done on, on, on that individual level, not someone that already has a title, but that hardworking man and hardworking woman and those kids in that community that are just trying to do what they can day to day to make it, they're the people that can really make a, a difference. Not, not, not the elected official, not the minister, you've got to go beyond that. So. First thing, the first step in, de in developing a good policy, a good strategy in dealing with this issue, this scenario, is first, it's not your group, it's not your tactics that you work out, it begins with self. I mean, what are your opinions and ideas and how are you presenting yourself when you talk to someone? When you're in your given community, do you talk to people a lot differently than when you go across the railroad tracks? And if you don't appear to be sincere, people aren't going to listen to you anyway. And that's true, it doesn't matter what issues that we're talking about. So I think the key thing has to be, first, your sincerity. Do you really or really want to work with folks, or is it, do you see it as a, a means to an end? And now, the means may be a vested interest, but if you can't have a little concern and compassion and start thinking about people as people, then you're not going to get very far. Because at best case, you'll have some folks come to your meetings, but if they're not in leadership, or they're not part of developing what, are, you know, what, what politicians are we going to target or what's going to be our initiative at the legislature next year, but they're just there as bodies, then we're not getting anywhere. So the first thing is have to deal with how you deal with things personally. And I can't, I wish I had some magic and I was just like, okay, now we're all taken care of. But that's something that we have to deal with on an individual level. And, and also we'll figure out how do we relate to folks in our day to day besides just being concerned about environmental issues. When you go to the grocery store, do you, sit, do, you, do you smile and say hi to the folks that are there, regardless of what their skin color or their gender is, or are you kind of standoffish because, well, that's one of those black males and he's probably in a gang because I seen him on TV last night. Um, and we, we have to be able to overcome some of those barriers that we place for ourselves first. But once we get past that, then we have to look at what is our group doing? What, what is the makeup of our group right now? And if someone came to one of our typical meetings, would it be accessible? Could someone come into our come to our Tuesday night meeting and be able to say things, or would they just have to sit in the back and then wait? Is, 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 is the structure so formal that new people can't feel like they can become a member of this organization? Because if you're going to make some real change, the people within your group have to feel ownership for it. They have to feel that when I come to these meetings or when I go to that protest or I go to that public hearing, it's a matter of these are, these, these, these are my people, this group, and this group of folks that represent this community that are trying to make a change, and I trust these folks, and I care about them. Because if it's just, well, you know, we want you, we want all you people, we need some more women. It's a good idea if we can get some women and maybe some little kids running around, make it real good for the, the media. We don't really want the women to make any decisions. And uh, we don't want, we, they can be a secretary or something like that. But if they're not part of, of the decisions that are being made, and they're just there for, you know, window dressing, how long is your group going to hold up? How long are you really going to make some, some true impact in your community? And how can you really talk about wanting democratic principles in your community to be treated fairly if you can't treat the people within your community fairly? And I think those are some, just some key things in, in that area in you know, talking about your group. Now, in some of the areas, and how do you do that outreach? Often I'm told folks, well, we put up some flyers, and nobody came. Or we put up some flyers, and one person came, and then they didn't come back again. So, so I say, well, so what did you do next? Well, nothing. It's like, well, why don't you send some flyers out? Well, it didn't work. Well, did you follow up on it? Did you do it again and again? Um, I like to use an analogy. I, I played football when I was in high school. And game day was on Friday. When Friday came, we didn't make up new plays and try to work them out on the field. We had run our plays Tuesday, or Monday through Thursday. We knew what we were going to do. We had a game plan. And then when game day came, we just did the same thing we've been doing all week. 
Well, that's the same way you have to look, I think, about building your group. You got to do role plays and trainings, and extra meetings, and you got to keep doing the same things over and over and over and over again until it's easy. You, you know, if you want to make some inroads in the community, then you keep going back and you keep being persistent because if folks keep seeing your face, they know, well, this isn't this kind of a one-shot thing. This guy came here and came to that thing we had a couple weeks ago. Or I think they might want to talk to us. And it's something that's sincere and people will build a trust because you keep doing the same thing. You send those flyers out and you do things. One of the things that I found that I mostly work in minority or low income communities, the trust issue is so vital to working in these communities. And before you can even get to the point where you're actually organizing, you, the, the trust issue is so important because a lot of these communities have seen, we're not talking about it was polluted yesterday. 10 years, 30 years, 20 years of pollution uh, of you know lawsuits where they've gotten nothing, government um, officials coming in and doing nothing. In your opinion, um, how have you been able to to work through that trust issue? It's a slow process. I think one thing that comes about, particularly any of the contaminated sites, I, I think the, for me the proposed facilities and the contaminated are two different ball fields because one can be done quick and easy, at least in preventing something. The other one's a long process, and there's a long trust. I mean, I'm sure that you've all heard, well, well, where have you been all this time? You know, we've had these problems for 20, 30 years, and now all of a sudden there's all these people that call themselves environmentalists, and they're concerned about me. Where were they you know, five years ago? Where were they two minutes ago? Well, I think the key is building that trust and not having the assumption that folks haven't done anything and don't know what the problem is. There's a lot of times we say, well, we need more education uh, in, 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 in poor communities. We need more education in these contaminated communities without accepting the fact these people live here every day. They know exactly what time the emissions are the highest. They know exactly how many people have died of cancer. They can tell you when the trucks first came in 10, 20 years ago. And instead of having the attitude that I think we often carry, because uh, as, as, as environmentalists, we are enlightened. We have all this information, and, and particularly when, once we've only been in a few years or so, we're like, well, I know all this stuff about incineration. I'm going to go and I'm going to tell these people all about incinerators without at finding out what do they know already, what can I, what do they have to teach me. I think if we go in and we're talking with communities with a more open mind, and we're willing to, to listen first, to see what has been what has been attempted, what has been successful, what has failed, and then share resources and look at it in more in terms of a partnership as opposed to I'm going to tell you how to resolve your problem, that's where we make some difference. And I think that's where you can build some trust because it's not this assumption I already know everything. I might know how to tell people how to feed a dump, but I'll be honest, I don't know how to tell someone how to feed a contaminated site right off the bat because it's not that easy, and I have to learn what is going on in that community and how the politics play out, who are the real movers and shakers. Often, I think, in the contaminated sites, it's not just typically that one elected official that's the crony in the county or the parish that can do something, but there's some other forces at play. You know, it may be the sheriff's department, it may be something else where there's some other vested interest in this, this contaminated site who remain contaminated or not being cleaned up or remaining in operation. So I guess this, the key thing in answering your question is let's learn from folks. Let's sit down and talk in partnerships and share resources. And don't just assume because people are poor or there's not a good education in a formal sense in that community that folks don't already know what's going on because there's a lot more that you can gain from those people that are already there, particularly in terms of gathering up real stories, dramatic stories about what has gone on and gone on for a long time as opposed to here, you know, these stories you need to see this. Yeah, uh, for me it's uh, quite simple. Uh, review your written material. And uh, that's the first thing someone sent me something, I review it. And believe it or not, it's very patriotic. You know, it's from the uh, uh, bottom, uh, from the top down. And uh, I find this, I've been doing this for about 15 years. And finally, uh, environmentalists, the SMAs I call them, suburban liberals, uh, have come to the, the notion that we're making something into this. When uh, I started originally with lead, an environmental problem that's got felt ramifications. 
and I had some environmental say, but is it an environmental problem? I was hitting my head against the wall on that. But I say, just read the material, see how it plays out, what people are saying to you. Your flyers, did you go have them to participate in writing the flyer? See, when you sent the flyer out, there's someone there, there's an ally there, there's an ally everywhere you can identify. But she has a few people saying that there may be other persons at that particular time. And you need to go work with that so you can get the dumb side of it. I want to emphasize something here. Uh, European Americans, when they approach minorities, I, I know especially blacks, seem to be put off by the fact that many blacks do not seem to speak the English language well. So what do you do? You zero in on the one or two people in the community who perhaps have had more education than the others of that community, and, and you want to call these your leaders. And these people often are not the leaders of that community. They just have, to have a little more glib tongue. Um, in the community where I live, an elementary school education wasn't even present in that rural community until the 50s. So people my age just didn't get an education, period. But they're smartest whips. They got what you call mother wit. They'll put me to shame on any good day. And I have got a tremendous education just from being in that community and listening to these people. And, and you have to go beyond the split verbs and the dangling participles and, 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 and the, the, the dialect and listen to the substance that is there and you're dealing with some extremely smart, perceptive people you can learn a lot. I'd like to follow up on that. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, starting in 1980 with Operation Mainstream, uh, in the next seven years we graduated 10,000 people out of uh, the Lawback Method of Teaching Literacy. And it was about about 85% black, and you're really right. What didn't work was going to the Caucasian King's English. It didn't work. What did work was going to uh, the black female uh, school teacher to be the one-on-one, -on -one, because all of us is one-on-one. -on -one. It's done one step at a time. It's one individual. I mean, I'm sure in this room, the, Pretty much everyone is here because at some point or another, one individual asked you to do something and you made a decision to do it. And that's part of the reason why you're here today. And that's part of the reason why other folks aren't here today is because they haven't necessarily been asked. They haven't been talked to in that one-on-one -on -one fashion. Because that's how it changed. Even though it seems like it would be easier if we just did one big television special and talked about how bad the environment was and then everyone would understand all the problems and then we could change everything. Yeah, right. I mean, it, it's done when I can talk to you as an individual and, and we have a trust and a rapport and I can listen to what you're saying. Another thing about language that everybody that, that says that they do work in environmental issues, I think at one point or another are guilty about this in terms of language, is using all these doggone acronyms. I mean, every, you know, it, it's, you know, we've got lean, which is a fine acronym, but then you've got ATSDR, you've got the CDC, uh, RICRA, uh, TRI, blah, blah, blah. It's all alphabet soup. And I've been places where I start forgetting what things stand for. I'm like, oh, or I hear myself saying stuff. Uh, and, and I don't even realize what I'm saying. I got, I got put in my place once, and I try to get put in my place often when I go visit my grandparents and talk about environmental stuff. They, they set me straight. I was um, with my grand, grandma. I was with them. This was enough to was with uh, these, these older black women. There's three of them. I was going to talk to them about environmental problems. You know, like, and I was going to let them know everything. I was telling them about toxic waste and hazardous waste and how bad it is and how it causes these heart, these uh, carcinogenic uh, uh, additives that are in this and in these cancer clusters and everything. And they just sit, sit, sit there and they smiled at me. And then one lady that let me go on for about 15 minutes, like, son, could, could you stop for a second? You keep saying hazardous and toxic. Are you meaning poison? <laughs> And I said, well, yes, ma'am, that is what I mean. Well, why don't you say what you mean? <laughs> Instead of going off there. And, and that's the key. We're, we're talking, basically, when we're talking about the communities we're dealing in, we're talking about regular folks. 
who don't have a lot of time, a lot of fancy language, and a lot of other things. They talk regular English, and it doesn't mean you should, you know, if, you, if you've got a PhD, it doesn't mean you shouldn't, you know, try to lower yourself or something like that. You have to talk honestly from the heart. But you don't have to use all the acronyms, and you can try to speak regular English. If you have a great vocabulary, then you should know how to be able to speak to people, regardless of what the background is. And we need to be conscious of this. Another thing following up on, on the, particularly I'm going to speak, what I know what happens is when the folks are dealing with the black community, that somehow that intelligent, literate black man is the one we want to talk to. I wish I had a couple of dollars for every time I was getting a call by someone that said, uh, we have this community and we want to get these folks to the public hearing, uh, but they're not going to come, so would you come and speak for them? like, oh, I don't live in that state or that county or that city. Uh, I can't represent these folks. And it's not said, but I, but I know it's like, but you're, you're a black man who does environmental work, so of course you can speak for all black people. And, you know, and I don't think there was a meeting with a few, you know, 10, 20 million folks that gave me the responsibility to be the black man in the smoke for the community. And not in any community is there any one black person that's been given the responsibility to speak for the entire community. Uh, we've got to, you can't just have one person speaking for anybody. People must speak for themselves. And that means you have to go out and make connections in that community. And if you truly want to build something, when it gets down to the, that building a strong organization, because that's the key. It's, it's, we can do a lot as individuals, but it's organizing, which is the key to our work, is having truly a diverse group of folks. That you have men and women, black and white, you know, poor and middle income folks working together and scares politicians, because they're not used to that. They're used to knowing, well, I'm Charlie Republican, and uh, I know that this district, everyone has this income level, and they'll vote for me because I'll support them. And I ignore those little other, those, those poor whites and poor blacks because they won't vote anyway. But when those poor whites and poor blacks start getting together, and this has been known throughout American history, when black people and white people, of various, and particularly poor folks, have gotten together, it scares folks. People, what's going on over there? And people start jumping on bandwagons and saying they're all about, I'm about hunger issues now. I'm concerned about lead. I'm concerned about all kinds of things because I've, I'm trying to keep ahead of that power curve or whatever it is they say. Yeah, I've I got religion now. But, but if you have people working together, it's strong. It's democracy in action. And democracy, in true sense, is scary to folks. Because everything that we're orientated and educated about is not about democratic principles. It's not about we all get together and we all agree on what we're going to talk about. It's, well, we'll elect, first of all, we'll elect the president. And it should be a well-spoken, educated man, uh, preferably someone in this district. So see, that's a problem there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, you look at, at education, and you look at uh, the church, which most of us get most of our background at, at least until the age of 18, and then we start hopefully having some better ideas. And I, I think most of us start thinking about things younger than that. But they're very hierarchical, and they're not about democracy. You go to school, and someone stands in front of a blackboard and tells you what you should know. It's not we share information and what is it that you did today and things like that. You go to church. And someone stands in front of or behind a pulpit and tells you what you should know. And it's not about sharing. And that doesn't mean that your church and your educational system has to be that way. But we have those models in our mind. And so when we first start organizing, typically we do that. And it, oh, and it sits you down that slippery slope of not working with different types of people and not expanding and getting new ideas and being willing, if you are the president this week or this year, to you know, take a step aside and bring up some new leadership with some new ideas. We can't have the same folks doing everything or we have that same entrenched problem that we already see in, in, in our, either on the national level with you know, Sierra Club and those type of organizations or we see on our local organizations where, uh, tell me this, where I, this is one of my pet peeves, I think they've done great work with NAACP. On the national level, on local levels, typically the same four or five folks have been the leadership of this organization. And often folks will say, well, if I want to work with the black community, shouldn't I go to the NAACP? I'm like, no, no, no. Do you ever talk to anybody? Do you, you know what people really think about the NAACP in that given community? If they have a high esteem or well, an opinion, that may be fine, but they might be part of the problem. I mean, you have to go to the people, you know, and not go with, you know, you've got, you've got to go to where they live at. And the fundamental first thing we talk about in organizing, no matter what our issues are, <laughs> is you got to go talk to your neighbor. You got to do some door knocking. Well, 
if we start thinking about our community in a broader sense than just our immediate neighborhood, but where it is that all of our kids go to school, or where it is that we all work, or where we all buy our groceries at, and we think about it in a broader sense of community, then going across the railroad tracks isn't that big a deal, and it's not any different from talking to your, your literal next door neighbor, it's just your neighbor maybe two, three miles down the road, and doing some door knocking. And I understand that there can be some kind of fear and apprehension because, well, I've never done this before. Some people have been honest enough to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a 35-year-old housewife, and I'm just now getting into this, and I've never really talked to a lot of black people in my life. And I don't know what, they're, are they going to be afraid of what I'm going to say? Are they going to distrust me? I don't know what, you know, they, they won't believe in anything I have to say. And I, and I say to people, look, we're human beings. We all have the same fears and apprehensions. And in this country, as much as we like to point out all the differences, we have much more in common than we ever give, give us credit for. We, we've all seen, you know, the same stupid television shows, but everybody has seen Brady a bunch of half a dozen times. You know, we, we've, we've all seen the news and we've yelled at it how stupid it is. You know, if we if we like sports, we or even if we don't like sports, we've cheered for Michael Jordan or Muhammad Ali or something like that. We have more in common, and as Southerners specifically, we have commonalities in terms of food, which I like to talk about. You know, we have cultural things that are very much the same. Uh, there is not a whole lot of difference culture-wise between uh, Southern poor whites and particularly Appalachian folks and Southern black people. All of us eat turnip greens, uh, or at least at one point we had to. But um, uh, the, the point is, go ahead, you know, you have to deal with that fear and apprehension, but the only way you, you, you meet that fear is to go up and knock on that door and say, hey, and how are you doing? Yeah, the door might get slammed in your face, but your own relatives will slam the door in your face faster than anybody else. So what, what do you have to be concerned about? You know, you've got to go and start making that effort. And once you get that confidence, you make that one contact with somebody. And then it expands, and that person can take you around and tell you who it is in the community that you need to meet and talk to. But you share, but you do it on that individual level, and you build something. You build something more powerful than beating a, a facility. You build a greater sense of community. You build this definition of the environment being more than just the birds and the bunnies, but the environment being everything around us. And that we have to have a say in what we think is right, and what we do want for our communities, and what we don't want. And if we work we, that way, we start shifting start looking at things in a broader picture. Because another thing that, that I think is true in, in, in a lot of different communities, uh, everybody's doing something before you come to their door. There's, there's no reason to assume, I think we sometimes think, all right, we got this incinerator we have to deal with, and I've got to tell everybody because they're not working on this, they're just uninformed. Well, yeah, they might not be working on an incinerator, but maybe the kid has chicken pox. <laughs> you know, maybe somebody just lost a job. Maybe a loved one died. We, there's other things that are going on in anybody's life. There's very few people I know that literally have nothing else to do and they just sit around all day. There's more they should be doing. Because if we're going to change things in this society, we have a role to play as citizens that we are not doing enough of as it is. You can't just vote every few years and think you're being a good citizen. You have to do more. And I'm not I know I'm talking to the converted on this. You've got to go out and be aware because you can't trust someone else to represent your interest. You have to do it for yourself. You can't abdicate that role of citizenship and let someone else do it for me. But you've got to start realizing that other people are doing other things and how in the greater context of community and environment, what role does this play? Um, often it's, it's said, well, you're concerned about this. You may be concerned about lead issues, an example. Well, lead may not, you know, is that really an environmental issue? Isn't that kind of an urban thing? That's urban. You know, as George Bush would say now, it's urban policy type of issues, you know, we'll deal with it there. As opposed to, look, how does this play in the greater environment of this community? You know, how does education play a role? How is health care? All of these things are integrated. When we start thinking very compartmentalized, we miss the point. We miss the point where we're able to compromise on things and we make a lot of mistakes because we're not looking how this fits into the broader context of the world. You're talking about environmental issues, you've got to be able to talk to folks on, um, for an example, an incinerator. An incinerator is not just bad because it, it's uh, going to reduce recycling efforts. It's going to hurt the, you know, the health effects that come from it. And you can just go ahead and say, point. and if you start having these health effects, we've got health issues. Where's the nearest clinic? Where's the nearest hospital? Are the doctors going to work with you? I mean, there's a whole 
big context and the world that we live in. And we have to be able to talk in terms of how this impacts on the overall community and not just this one narrowly defined problem. And being able to talk that way, we're able to make connections with folks. I just want to make one comment. I think one of the most dangerous things that has been happening for quite a long time and will continue to happen unless we organize as, as blacks, whites, poor, whatever, is that the federal government has a built-in prejudice when it comes to health issues in poor communities and especially in rural areas. And, and we have to do something about this because we're literally being told we're dying because of our, our living habits, what we eat, our sex habits. That's in Louisiana. Um, we've got to do something about that. And it's, it's just fundamentally built in to the federal health agency's way of thinking. We need to organize on that and do something about it. That, that's definitely true, because I remember reading um, part of some research that one of our interns was down here found out that the reason why there's such a high cancer rate in Louisiana, it's not that cancer alley and all those petrochemicals and all. You people down here eat too much hot sauce. Yeah. Hot sauce. You put too much, put it on everything, it makes people sick and give them cancer. That's what the problem is. You know, and I don't you know, and it's that kind of mentality that it's just completely, it does not care. It makes uh, sacrifice zones of where people live because it's like, well, we don't care. We just don't care. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that I, I agree with your, with your uh, premise here, and that is, I mean, if you look at the community, and people talk about the African American community, people talk about the overall community, the white power structures. All of these communities have power structures. I don't think that organizations have the wherewithal to simply, you know, if you're dealing, let's say, with an incinerator, which is the example, you, you've got you've got a, a vanishing window of opportunity. Oftentimes, you can, you have to move it. I think what you've got to do first is to analyze the power structures in various communities. I mean, really analyze it. As you say, you went, you know, you dealt with ministers. Well, I mean, I dealt with hundreds of ministers. Spoken at many, many uh, churches, African American churches, white churches. And there are ministers, and there are ministers. Some of the ministers are are uh, are captured by the by the overall power structure. But there are some that are not. You have to know the community well enough to know which ones that you can go to. And you have to know not only the churches but also the community organization. Because, like you say, people are going to say, "Where have you been before?" So if you go, and there are things that are there for there are churches, there are community organizations. New Orleans, you've got social aid and pleasure clubs, some of them political, some of them not political. You have to know all that if you're going to approach a community. But by approaching the right points in the power structure, you can get those, you can get people to sponsor what you're doing. And then when you put on an organization or a, 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 a group, then you, you distill the process where the individuals who are coming to that meeting uh, are, are not simply, are, are people who are, are more willing to take action because they understand where they are within the power structure. I don't think that we have time or resources to just, you know, just go into the community and start knocking on doors. And, I mean, the people that you're going to come in contact with, like you said, they've got chicken pox. Then your kids may have chicken pox. They may have lost their job. They got, they've got 10 feet on them. Mm -hmm. well. and, 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 you're going to lose your window of opportunity. Well, see, but see I, I, I fundamentally disagree with you, though, because I'm a Democrat with a little D. The power structure is a problem. You need to change it. And try and, there needs to be always an analysis of, of, of who are the players and who, who, what is the power structure. However, the people that are really going to change and make this community, that I've used as an example, as not continuing to be a target, because yeah, you can go to those key uh, uh, political officials or, 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 or players within a given community, and if they agree with you on this, they raise enough noise, you're still a target. And you will always, that community will always be a target until the individual members in that community see that they have a role to play in changing that. And that's where you, de you develop and you build a strong organization that will change things. And there's the difference that, that we do have to make time. If we always, are going to the, the, the players as it is, instead of dealing with the people, then we're, we're playing a political game and we're feeding into the existing political structure. I've got a lot of questions. Well, that's why it's really important to be forward looking when you're, you're organizing because you've got to think ahead. You can't wait until you hear about this incinerator because by that time you've got a 30 day comment period and a public hearing it, and you can't get those people organized that fast a lot of times. So you have to think about going out there and making those contacts before an issue arises. So when an issue does arise, you already know those people, and you can get out there and say, hey, this is coming up. Let's get out to the hearing. Let's you know, do whatever we need to do. Well, 
to think that uh, taking Hubert's approach sort of solves the problem of, of a lot of the people who are probably going to be most vocally uh, supportive of your cause uh, may well be, and, and collectively their cause too, uh, um, it are people who are disenfranchised from from almost all the power structures that, that are just fed up with, with the stuff that's been crammed down their throats and they're, and they're tired of it. So when you go to those people who feel frustrated, when you go to the bottom and build from the bottom up, you're bringing back in a lot of people. Uh, and in fact, you're also making the communities uh, power structure, if you would, more accountable to the people by bringing those people back into the fold, and they, in turn, will uh, probably make their own leadership more accountable. I think uh, the whole uh, kind of in the whole by that same token, so the whole premise of organizing in grassroots nature is that you're totally bypassing the power structure on the main, you know, whole basic thing. Um, one of the things you're talking about talking at the level of the people, I think that's one of the things which I learned when I was canvassing for citizen action, is we were canvassing very working class neighborhoods most of the time. And getting those stories of those people, as you said, and the stories of people who actually work in these chemical companies, and they're telling me things that go on in front of and stuff like this. And um, by the same token, any time that I've been in a demonstration, I couldn't tell you the number of times that I've had people in the community thank us for being there. It's also a matter of any time we're in a demonstration, we get out and we get out, we walk around the demonstration. You can see the, that last demonstration we had two weeks ago, I spent over half my time across the street at the car wash talking about people who were stopping there. And, and it's really it's really amazing because then the media, well, first off, you know, you're building, you're, you're just going directly to the people. You're doing that when you're canvassing, you're doing that when you're doing this, when you're marching around the demonstration, you're totally bypassing. And then, of course, the media comes in, they interview you, they film your march. Then they go around the film and then they interview some people in the media area who you probably already talked mm -hmm. to. And it's really pretty funny. And, and it really shows support. that there's a change going on. That's how you, you work on, on being with that. Yeah, why, why, would you, why would anyone assume that a particular community power structure is illegitimate just on its face? I mean, I think that the power structure, whether it's the churches, the community groups that are there already, they need to be given an opportunity to respond to the situation. And if, they, if they're bought off, in fact, I mean, I dealt with the buyout issue of the city of New Orleans. We had ministers that were getting $150,000 from utility companies. Uh, you know, until they're proven to be really illegitimate, why, I mean, it's almost racist to do that, in my opinion. Mm, I, I disagree, because to me, it's almost like a company having to prove, you know, the burden is on the community to prove that there's some poisoning taking place as opposed to the company being able to prove that we're a clean operation. I think what, what it's a matter of, we need new organizations and there's something there's something fundamentally wrong in this country about what the power structures that, that exist because there are people disenfranchised. Just because someone's a minister or an elected official does not necessarily mean they represent the interests of the given community. No question. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying that why do we necessarily have to make assumption that, that that this is an illegitimate process? We can prove it, and then you may have to change your tactics. With an example, a sample, okay? The churches, you see the churches, or you see the, 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 the community, and you know that all of this stuff has been occurring for the past 30 years. Has that church, has that ministry ever had anything to say about Thank what's you. happening in that community? No. I mean, if he has, you have heard about it. If you get a minister who is truly, or, or any other leader in the community, who is truly interested in what's happening to his people, you hear about it. They, they, those churches start, start the action. You don't have to go to him, he'll come to you. So that's why you assume that the minister, I don't know about being bored or, I mean, I don't know, but that he might that interest, he's got his own agenda. You can, you can make that assumption valid. And that's personal experience. I've got a lot of personal experience too. Let me explain one more. I'll give you an even closer relationship. As a child, I, I come from New York City. I belong to Addison Your Baptist Church. Adam Clayton Powell, everybody knows him. He was in Congress, right? I mean, he taught me how 
to, to integrate the bus company in New York City. I mean, there were playing ministers in Harlem. He had to fight them all. So that's why you assume that the rest of them are not have their own agenda. I don't know how to get to you any better if you can't see that analogy. I mean, Martin Luther King, when he came to New Orleans, was not accepted by the ministerial community. I mean, it's just, I understand that they have their own power structures. But on the other hand, if you, if you understand it well enough, it, I just, I think that it's fundamentally wrong to say power structure within a particular community is, per se, uh, illegitimate. But I think what is your point? <laughs> My point yeah, is we have limited time, limited resources, very often to impact a particular situation. And if you're saying, well, you know, we need to go into the community and, and solve uh, you know, health care problems, you know. But see, but see, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, look, but, 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 but that, it gets or into, we if we don't have that long-term perspective, I'm not saying that we have to build this, you know, whatever massive coalition for social change every time something comes up, but if we're not thinking long-term in the first place, and we're not thinking, how does this impact on the overall community, you will never change the fundamental disenfranchised, disempowered situations that exist in a community. That, that narrow focus and trying to work with the players is not so much that they're illegitimate, but as this lady said, the people in the community will tell you the ministers that are going to do something. And that and that's where you've got to deal with on that fundamental grassroots level. Let me try to, yeah, I'm trying you guys are disagreeing with you. Don't you have to, there's bills coming up in the legislature. If I start knocking on doors tomorrow, that this bill's coming up in the legislature, I might get two people to call a legislature. But, and I, I should do that, or if I have the resources, I should have people knocking on doors saying, hey, this bill's coming up, if, you, if we don't fight it, or if you, you know, if feel like it's important, let's work on it. At the same time, if I go to that legislator, maybe nobody's ever talked to him before. Maybe, just maybe, the only person that's ever been to him has been an industry person with the donation. Maybe, given a rational argument, given some impetus with the two people that you have, I mean, I think, I don't know why we're arguing, because I think you have to do both. Obviously, the grassroots end of it has been neglected for years, and people tend to work top down. And I'm always fighting top down for, you know, the issues that I've worked on in the past. But, but I, I think what we're trying to do is, is come to some understanding that you have to work bottom up in, in the North community, as well as the other communities that are also ignored. And, and, and sometimes a minister or, or a leader might never I mean, we all come to realization one day, hey, I've never worked on the environment and it's killing me. And like, I'm not even come to it five years ago, and yet I'm 40, so for 35 years I never did anything. And so maybe that minister and not done it for 50 years. But like one day, maybe it'll hit them if the right person goes to talk to them, the right information. That, so, you know, I think you have to do both. Well, there's a little both, but I guess what my, my bottom line is, is the thing is not working issue to issue, crisis to crisis, but building an organization that has a perspective and is, and is owned by the community that is dealing with the, the totality of the issues that are taking place. And yes, there are those times where you make those one or two phone calls, but the, in the long run, the change is made by the people in that community. The, the very fact that the problem exists in the community is indicative of the fact that the power structure is not working and that it is inappropriate. I have been to many communities where facilities, people look around and, and the facility, the land is being bought, the, the police jury or the council or whatever has already approved it, and the people are hollering, we don't want this. And in spite of the fact that the people in large masses, you know, majorities, 80, 90% of the people are saying, we don't want this, the power structure, the councilmen, the jurors, the ministers are all pushing the thing. If the power structure is working right, you don't have a problem in the community. I've worked with a lot of different communities, and if, when Gary says it's a window of opportunity, I, I think that's, if you've got a hearing or, or something on it, you do have a very specific time frame when you can do something. You do need to try and identify people who can move the community leaders and, or get community leaders involved. But, uh, a lot of you dealing with frustrations on specific problems. In, in Florence Robinson's community, she lives near uh, has this way site. But if you look near that, that's, that's a very serious problem. But there, I, since 1978, I've helped to organize maybe seven groups in her area. Uh, many of those groups feel that they are the only legitimate voice of that community. Uh, 
many of the groups do not talk to each other. They all, they all talk to me, but they, they fight with each other. They go different ways. Sometimes it's very divisive. Uh, so there's a lot, and, and it's sort of a little microcosm of, of what's going on. And they split the issues black white. Some of the folks in the community supported David Duke. Some of them are still talking to each other. Uh, it, it's, it's complex. Uh, but it's, I think, important to understand that we don't all have the answers that uh, we're going to continue to have these struggles for a very long time. And, and issues have changed in that community over time. The issue on, on Rollins, which is a waste site, has changed over time. Uh, we used to have big open pits, and we used to have all sorts of other things. And the, and the people in the community since 1978 have become very sophisticated, a little more sophisticated, in understanding that there is a process out there, that they have to put pressure on the media, on the public officials. But uh, Wilma and I have gone around to a lot of groups in Calcasieu Parish. Every time there's a new issue, the folks who ought to be doing the organizing over there and who know how to do it. I mean, they know how to organize better than I ever hope to. They'll call us because they want a little backup from somebody from out of town. And say, hey, like, it's calling Will in. Because Will somehow knows all the answers about how to organize. Uh, and Will just says, I don't know a damn thing about organizing. But it, it's whether you deal with local, state, or federal issues, how to deal with the media, all that kind of stuff. It, I don't think any one approach is going to solve it. it. It's, you know, it's crazy, but it's something you, if you're going to be involved in this, it's being kind of stepping back and saying, how important is this issue to me? How important is it to someone else? The first time I went into the Allison community, I went in to an all-black home in, in an all-black community. There were about 30 people in there, and all I could feel were eyes staring at me saying, who is this honky, and what is he trying to sell us tonight? And it moved from that to a community which beat up on a commercial waste disposal site. Uh, Filed, they eventually filed lawsuits against it. They cleaned up a lot of it. The Florence, who didn't get involved until a few years ago, is still one of the worst things to have as a neighbor. It has not cleaned up. It's still a very serious problem, and it's killing them. Um, so some people feel they've solved the problem. Other people feel that they haven't. And they all live in the same community, basically, in the same area. So I, I think there are a lot of opportunities, and I don't know exactly what the answers are, but it's just could you take one more question that we have to break, okay? Okay. Call Will. <laughs> I, I just want to say, I, I agree with what you said about having a door slammed in your face. I live briefly in California, and I was I worked a little while with the environmental group there canvassing and, and fundraising. And when uh, I was told that one, one of the nights we were going to go canvass in Santa Monica, I said, oh, man, it's great. Uh, those are upper income people, uh, white, liberal. They're going to give us tons of money. And I was amazed at the door slammed in my face and liberal open minded in line. So, what, yeah, what you're saying is absolutely right. That can happen anywhere, to anybody. Okay, just to kind of wrap up, and so we you know, weren't talking too much and listening to other folks. But, uh, of course, we didn't solve all the, the problems here. It's too bad. I think we had another five minutes we could have. But, you know, <laughs> The, the, the point is this, there's a lot of different ways to go about doing things, and the, but we need to start engaging them more. Because as citizens in a democracy, we have certain rights that often we, we, we take for granted or we don't even recognize that we have. We have the forces that be and the power structure that exists and often the, people, you know, the money that's out there doesn't really want people to engage and, and what your rights are. But not only do we have rights, we have responsibility. And I think part of that responsibility is building those bridges, talking to other folks, to building strong organizations that can address these problems. We talk about us and, you know, and us and ours instead of them and theirs. We, we need to work together and we need to start on an individual level. And that's what the hope is. Because my hope is that we, we look at things instead of the short-term way that we look at stuff, but you know what's going to happen in the next 30 minutes or what's going to happen in the next financial quarter and think of more what's going to happen in the next five to ten years and what do we want to see happen. And that we want to see diverse peoples working together saying what this country can have and what we don't want to have. That way we will address fundamentally the problems and we can shift this, this problem we have where other people are telling us what we, we, we're going to get 
and said, we're determining what we want. And I think that's key to democracy, and I think that's key to breaking down these barriers, be it race or ethnic or, or economic status or gender. A lot of these are false. There's not real walls between us. We can sit in this room and talk to each other as a human beings and individuals and share the differences that we have and learn from one another. And that is the, that's key to if we're going to ever solve these environmental problems and we're ever going to get anywhere and we're going to have some place to live 20 years from now and our kids will have some place to live, is being able to work together and share and realize that we're, in all, we're all in this together however we go about doing it. So thank you. This is the hardest part, is telling you you've got to quit. There's more coming. <laughs> I know you could go on another five minutes to solve all the problems, right? <laughs> uh, well, you will have a very short five minutes. Make it four and a half and be back here. Uh, I'm sure you feel like you need a break.